Truth Demonstrates A Lecture by Charles Fillmore According to the Scriptures, John the Baptist was in prison, and he sent his disciples to Jesus with the message, Are you the one who is coming, or should we expect someone else? Jesus answered, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good tidings preached to them. Truth demonstrates its own propositions. Jesus represented truth. He was truth, and to prove his authority, he had but to call attention to the works which he did. Most people believe that the New Testament is true because Jesus authorized it. But Jesus delegated all authority of his doctrine to the Spirit of truth. He shall guide you into all the truth. The truth, as demonstrated by Jesus Christ, is a restorative power. It restores all things to their divine order. Error has torn down the natural world, including man. Emerson said, referring to the human family, a man is a god in ruins. Man is God manifest, and if he is not demonstrating the perfect structure of divine life, there is ruin somewhere. Jesus demonstrated that truth proves itself in restoring order and wholeness to man. When you know the truth in substance, in life, in power, in love, in all the real qualities of truth, the body will demonstrate the truth. Your eyes will receive their sight, and your ears will be opened. You will walk as you never walked before, and good tidings will be preached to that poor, sinking, empty spirit in you. Jesus did not mean that the gospel would be preached to people poor in worldly things, and that rich people would go without it. But he meant that those who were poor in spiritual things would, because of their open minds, eagerly receive the truth. Truth cannot demonstrate its abiding power unless it is understood. The people whom Jesus raised from the dead died again. They did not get the quickened understanding of truth. Propositions of truth must be thought out and lived out before they are fully demonstrated. Many people are deluded by cramming the intellect with lessons on truth. One truth statement understood and demonstrated in life is worth more than oceans of lessons and statements about truth. Some wag has suggested as a new version of the familiar adage, you may lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You may bring an ass to knowledge, but you can't make him think. Every mental process involves some brain action, and spiritual knowledge demands the deepest kind of thought. There is an intuitive something in us that tells us what truth is, when we think and when we meditate. Truth is the real being of God, and God reveals himself to all of us when we, with open minds, listen, listen to the word of being itself. There is a spirit in man, and the breath, inspiration, of the Almighty giveth them understanding. You can analyze God. You have a right to. Men have been taught that they are poor, weak, and ignorant, and that the finite cannot comprehend the infinite. My inner logic, my spirit of truth, assures me that there is neither great nor small in divine mind. Man is the offspring of the one omnipresent mind, and he must have the capacity in himself to know that mind. He must have the power to know himself, to know himself as divine mind manifest. Consequently, we must know and comprehend God. The divine mind is open to us through the spirit of truth. This understanding clears away all the fogs of personality, ignorance, and superstition. All those wrong ideas that we have had about the character of God and man. When you pierce with your I am right through all these narrow, limited concepts of yourself and God that have separated you from your real being, the spirit of truth will open your higher understanding, and you will know what Jesus meant when he said, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. We know that the tendency of the universe is toward perfection. Everything is striving to perfect itself. Whence comes the initial force? We say nature, and nature is just another name for God. And that divine perfection is making happy and joyous everything and everybody in the universe. This is good. So we intuitively, logically listen to our higher reason and arrive at the conclusion that God is good. This is the first postulate and conclusion of truth. God is good and God is all. Consequently, all reality is good. Now, can you stick to that proposition in spite of all appearances? If you can, the spirit of truth is working in you. But you will find, when you openly declare this truth, that there will crowd into your mind every opposing appearance of evil, and voices within and without will say to you, 
Of course, God in spirit, away off somewhere in heaven, is good. But here is a world of evil. See the evil in nature. See the evil in men. Behold the evil tendencies in yourself. But in the face of all error you must demonstrate, God is good and good is all. Then you must lay hold of another quality of the infinite good. Good is all-powerful. Remember that divine mind is made up of ideas, and that each one of these ideas must be wheeled into line in man's mind, before he can put on the fullness of truth. So, if we find ourselves weak in our demonstration of the allness of good, we must hold that good is all-powerful. It makes no difference how powerful the evil may seem. We must hold the truth. No matter how many poor people there are, how many lame people, how many deaf people, how many sick people, these appearances have nothing to do with the proposition. Know that God is good, and good is all, and good is almighty. This knowledge adhered to will heal all sufferers. Establish that idea in your mind. You will find that a certain clearness, a certain spiritual perception and a power come to you that you never had before, because you are loyal to the spirit of truth. With the realization of the almightiness of the good, there may come to you the thought that all evil and all bad people should be destroyed at once. Very zealous Christians, like Jonathan Edwards, have been so possessed with this idea that they have given God the vengeful character of the devil, instead of the spirit of good. All Christians should know now that the greatest idea in divine mind is love. God is love. When the spirit of love begins to work in you, compassion, forgiving grace and charity will spring into your consciousness. And, instead of destroying Judas, killing him at one fell swoop, you will see the good in him and will reform him. The old method of reforming criminals was patterned after the method of John the Baptist. He destroyed all the error. That is, he tried to destroy it. He wanted Herod and Herodias and all those people who were doing evil things to be put right out of existence. But a greater teacher than John was to come. John meant well, but he had not been baptized into spirit. The desire in the intellectual man to follow the truth is good, but there is something better, the Christ. John is spiritual perception, which is very much less in the kingdom of heaven than the least of those who have spiritual understanding. The surest sign of the spiritual mind at work in man is forgiveness. You will love those who have despitefully used you. You will see unity in spirit and strive to establish it in the world when you have forgiven your enemies. So do not let the destructive idea, the burning up in hellfire, and the instant destruction of all bad people enter into your scheme of truth. God is preserving his universe. He is redeeming it. He is educating it. If we, in our overcoming would fall into line with this patient regenerative process, which sets in just the moment that we perceive truth. If we wish to follow it and demonstrate truth, we must take every attribute of God as revealed to us through Christ and put it into action in our lives. Truth is a healing force. Truth builds up the man. Truth restores the body. When Jesus Christ was accused of healing through the power of Beelzebub, the devil, he called attention to the inconsistency of the proposition which is as a house divided against itself. Then he emphasized the restoring power of God, that God is the only good, that God heals our bodies, that God is not the author of sickness. Jesus proved that God is not the author of evil in any of its forms. God is the author of health, and all health comes from God. When we attribute our ills to God, with the idea that they are sent upon us for some good, we are committing the unpardonable sin. Do you know what the unpardonable sin is? You will find that your dictionary defines the unpardonable sin as giving to God those attributes which are not His, and taking away from Him those attributes which are His. So, if you are under the thought that you have committed the unpardonable sin, just remember that the only way to be forgiven is to ask God's forgiveness for your thought that He was the author of evil. You must get into your understanding a clear idea of what the goodness of God is that that goodness extends into every department of your being, that if there be any evil in you in any way, it is the result of your own mortal error thought. If you are sick, do not blame God. Do not attribute your ill luck, your failures, or any of your shortcomings to God. Do not think for a moment that God has sent trouble upon you as a discipline. Many people, good people, Christian people, claim that God is giving them a lesson through some great trial some great bodily illness. 
That idea is wrong. It is the unpardonable sin. So long as you are in that attitude of mind, how can God forgive your errors and bring you back into truth? All people who stick to such propositions are beyond divine forgiveness. Then, you must repent, change your mind. You must realize that God, the good, demonstrates only good. Truth demonstrates itself in truth. When I know that God is the omnipresent good, and that God I occupies, as the spirit of good, every part of my being, including my body, from that moment the spirit of truth begins to build me up. It restores my hearing. It strengthens my eyes. It makes whole every part of my body. Then do not let go of the proposition that God is the health of his people. God is the one infinite life. Let us hold to the spirit of God that demonstrates itself in life everywhere. That is what the scientific world is preaching today. We cannot get away from this fact of the omnipresence of the one life. There is nothing else to come but this spirit of truth. We look for nothing else. We know that the spirit of truth is here. It was always here, but we have turned our faces in another direction. We have looked away from it. The spirit of truth is in the midst of you. It is in you, and you will never have peace of mind. You will never have success in any way. You will never have health of body. You will never have anything worth having until you demonstrate its presence and power in your life. You should begin thinking about this right now. We all are striving for some ideal. All men and women in the world have ideals. They want to be something beyond their present achievement. You will never realize your ideal until you go into partnership with God. You must know the truth of being. You must carry it out in every thought, in every act. Then you will have success. Then you will be satisfied. Then you will know that the spirit of truth does demonstrate itself in man. End of lecture.